Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the noon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I am joined by one co host, Ricardo Martinez, today, as Jerry has no internet connection. Uh, and today we are interviewing uh, Hayley Lennon, uh, someone who's done a shit ton of stuff, such as being a member of the Regulatory Council of Coinbase, Bitflyer, Silvergate Bank, uh, a founder of Crypto Connect, uh, contributor for Forbes, and a partner for Anderson Kill Law. Uh, and this is just the things on uh, her Twitter bio. So uh, there's a lot more to it. Uh, now, the first question I've got for you today, uh, we are known here at the moon for our hard hitting journalism. Uh, All right. I'm ready. <laughs> so you carried out a clubhouse debate back in uh, early 2021, which I think everyone really wants to know the outcome of the, the true answer. And that is, is cheese a condiment? <laughs> I was like, is he going to bring up the cheese? Um, that was actually my first club, maybe my first and only clubhouse um, participation. My uh, law partner, Stephen Pally, likes to debate about food. And um, so I don't think cheese is a condiment. You can dip things in it, but um, it can also be the main star of a dish like a grilled cheese or something. So I took, I took the, the argument that it's not a condiment. Okay, you'll be I happy like to know that you've chosen correctly, and we can continue this interview. Yes, no, yeah, we were, that turned into a crazy debate. And the weirdest thing is that, um, halfway through, my next door neighbor joined, and he, I didn't, he's not even really in the crypto space. And I was like, What, Connor, what are you doing in this chat about cheese? It was just a really small world, um, moment. Yeah, I remember the um, the early clubhouse days. Yeah. It was very fun. I found that like my my uh, cousin turned up randomly uh, in a Bitcoin chat, like a really like meme Bitcoin chat thing yeah. with like ten people. <laughs> it's yeah. just the weirdest, the weirdest like groups of people just appear. Like people from my childhood just rock up in like a Dogecoin shit chat or something. Because I yeah. ended up being in. Um, hey so guys, I quite liked that. Like, yeah. <laughs> it was well, good fun. Yeah, okay. started a conversation, especially with COVID. I think that those like chat groups. Um, were probably more popular than they would have been because we were all at home just craving, you know, interaction with other people. Exactly. It was like a social uh, interaction replacement. I um, Okay, no, so that's fine. I Just to close off, so Ricardo's with you. I feel like it's, it's actually, it can be both, um, which is fine. I think you it's a very to. flexible... <laughs> do you, why do you have... To, it's a very flexible food, right? So if it's nacho cheese, as, as Ricardo pointed out to me, that's condimenty, condiment-esque. I mean, you're mm -hmm. kind of pouring it. And then if you've got like a camembert and you're dipping, that could be like kind of like a condiment. But otherwise, I'm feeling like most of the time, cheese is not a condiment, uh, in you're, my opinion. You're misrepresenting my argument because I said that nacho cheese is not actual cheese. That's why it's a condiment. Oh. Okay. Right. And I Fair would enough. say that nacho cheese is a main ingredient or you won't even have the nachos. So once again, not a condiment. Ketchup, okay, right. on the other hand, you would never eat like a ketchup sandwich. But yeah, we, we had an hour long debate in that chat. So we could spend the whole time talking about that. Yeah, which I, we won't do that for the sake of people <laughs> listening. Um, I promise we'll move on. We should have had you in our debate team, though, because I just got, you know, uh, I just got schooled there. So uh, first question outside of our hard hitting journalistic insights uh, would be, well, I guess this is a good place to start is could you just give us like a summary talk through your journey? Like, how did you end up getting involved with crypto? in the yeah. first place and, and like how did that happen like you know who, who are you who is Haley? well how did yeah. it start it's actually a really interesting story and i don't go all the way back to the beginning often but um i was a, a first year attorney at a law firm and really didn't like it i was just doing like commercial litigation nothing about finance or crypto or anything like that and then after my first year i was like i'm gonna go in-house i want to work at an in-house you know company and that's really hard to do when you're early in your legal career because no one wants a second year attorney as their in-house counsel. You don't know what you're doing really. Um, but I found this little company. I went to law school in San Diego and there was this company in San Diego called DollarX. And what they were doing was wholesale currency exchange. So like dollars to pesos along the Mexico border, I like had the armored trucks and everything. And so I joined just to be general counsel, but I immediately was like, in the chief compliance officer's ear. Like, what's anti-money laundering? What are you doing? Like, what is the risk here? Um, and I kind of went down 
first I went down sort of the financial crime rabbit hole, like understanding um, money laundering and terrorist financing and those sort of things. Um, and then at the same time, my boyfriend at the time was talking my ear off about Bitcoin. It was 2013, 2014. I was sort of like, I don't, I think for some people, it takes a little bit of time to really get it. So at first I was like, mm, like, I don't really understand, but he started buying it and I started being more curious. And then Silvergate Bank popped up on my radar and reached out to me. Um, and they said, we're a, you know, a local bank here in town and we really want to bank cryptocurrency companies in the space. Um, and what you're doing at DollarX, like understanding the money laundering risks and the licensing requirements for wholesale um, currency exchange is actually really similar to some of the legal and regulatory issues that Coinbase and you know, Gemini's of the world are experiencing and what we need to understand before we can bank these companies. So then I joined Silvergate and I was just like, okay, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is the coolest industry ever. Um, you know, really started to meet some of like the big players in the space early on. And I was hooked. I was like, okay, this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life. <laughs> You've done something. You've done something. You did something that I always tell people, I like friends or whatever, uh, is basically to just follow what you find interesting, and what yeah. you like, and then yeah. stuff just seems to work out fine by chance. Um, yeah, it's, it's crazy. I mean, I could have. Um, I did. I totally took a risk, like not doing the traditional. You know, as an attorney, many um, partners now would have spent you know ten years at a law firm as an associate, um, really grinding away. And maybe not doing what they were passionate about, but I think because I took a chance and a risk and like pivoted um, and found this area that I was so interested in, I've just been able to like, um, you know, like see my career really flourish because it's like, it doesn't feel like work. Um, so it's, that's pretty cool. All right, it's, it's, uh, it's awesome. It's awesome to see, actually. I like that. Um, yeah. I suppose uh, one of the things that you're doing currently is uh, so I'm, I'm jumping a little bit forward um, usually i like to kind of go forward in time but uh yeah. this kind of interests me and and uh, is crypto connect yeah uh, that's uh, one of the things you're working on so with that it's probably a good idea to explain to people what it is uh which it should be hopefully simple um yeah. and then where did this idea come from and like yeah. what's it been like for you to do that because it's quite a big thing to try and build communities so like how's yeah. how's it going how's the experience been yeah, I mean, in some ways, I think I bit off more than I can chew. I mean, you were listing some of the things I'm involved in right now, and I'm a partner at Anderson Kill, and I write part time for Forbes. And um, but all of last year, once I joined as Anderson Kill as a partner, I was traveling around a lot for meetings and like business development. And I think COVID sort of changed how people live. You know, like people have turned sort of nomadic or they're moving around more often, or they're just relocating from some of these like major cities like New York and San Francisco. And so what Crypto Connect is, um, is it's trying to create like a decentralized community, but under one umbrella so that no matter where you are or traveling for work or moving, um, you can ping into communities. So um, we launched in 12 different cities in the United States, and we're actually adding eight more um, in the next month or so, and hope to go international eventually, but it's just have to take it kind of slow at first. Um, but so the idea is like we launched in these 12 major cities, and members can sign up through CryptoConnect.org and sort of choose what chapter they want to be affiliated with. But the goal is for people to be able to ping into those other um, chapters when they travel and, and move and things like that. And so the idea really came because I myself was traveling a lot last year for work. Um, and I was almost having to use my like Twitter um, platform to say, hey, I'm going to be in Nashville this week. Who's there? For one, that doesn't feel great for like security or like privacy <laughs> to like have to announce. Um, your travel plans but I also just like I was really having to like lean on Twitter to say what companies are here like who want who would be up to meet for a beer um, what meetups are good here um, and 
and like meetup.com and all these crypto meetups that already exist are great, but there's not like a centralized way to already know about those things. So I started talking to, you know, contacts in the industry and I was just like, this is frustrating, like that there's not sort of, um, bef you know, before I went into crypto, I was a, I was on the board of the um, ACAMS, which is a, the Association of Certified Anti-Money Laundering Specialists, but they have chapters all over the world. Um, and it's kind of easy to ping into like the legitimate companies and projects that want to, you know, do um, meetups or anything like that. So that's sort of where the idea came from. And uh, I never thought I'd be like the founder of anything. I, I'd not I think I have a pretty good risk tolerance for like career moves, but I never thought I'd like found an organization, but it just, as I started having conversations with more people in the space, it kind of organically grew. Um, and what was also exciting is that our board, you know, is all women led. And so that's sort of another topic, but just like having a women led organization, um, even though all of our events are co-ed and open to everyone, I think that that's kind of important to see like female leadership in this space because sometimes you don't see much of that. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I won't ask you to reach out to me if you move to London to 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 fire up because. <laughs> no, we actually some of the chapters we're adding uh, this month will be male led. So our, ah, our okay. you know, what, yeah. So I, I'd love your involvement. Honestly, um, we had like the board, you know, just sort of like in a way almost happened to be women because I was just sharing my experience with friends that I've had in the industry for years. And they were like, I'd love to be involved. I'd love to be involved. Oh, I know this other person that should be involved. Um, but the idea is really not, you know, we didn't call it like women in Bitcoin. The idea is not to be like, to really right. for gender, you know, like I don't want gender to be the point of discussion or even like more divisive. The idea is just like, Hey, everyone's welcome. And um, women, if you're interested in the space, know that there's other like mind, like like minded or people that look like you come on. But um, but I think it's super important for it to be like um, not not about gender. You know what I mean? Like really like Bitcoins for everyone. And so so is this organization. So I would, gotcha. I would love to have your involvement, honestly. Absolutely. Well, I say we've, we've hosted things in the London before as part of it refill. So I can always help out, I'm sure. But it's awesome. nice. It's interesting to know it just it happened to go that way. And yeah. um, it's, it's kind of a cool thing to do. As you say, you, you didn't expect to be starting up an organization. And then if you look at your uh, work you've done over the years, you think it'd be some kind of legal based thing. But actually, it's like something totally yeah. different. And it's like a community based thing, which is really uh, like yeah. positive. And I, I like that kind of reminds me of like maybe like the Rotary Club or even like a less yeah. secretive Masons, I guess, because like wherever yeah. you go, you've got someone that you can uh, yeah, talk to. Like, I mean, I think I found that when I travel, like even for fun, if I can have like, if I can attend one Bitcoin meetup and just like see what the vibe is in that city, like it's just, it's just nice to ping into that. And um, I mean, I think for me, like I'm probably half like legal focused in my career, but the other half is about making those connections um, and sort of getting to know everyone in the space. So it, it kind of overlaps well with my you know my general sort of character and what i like to do i just love getting to know new people and having conversations about bitcoin um coming from your background in, in anti-terrorism and money laundering stuff and, and yeah. compliance um what's your take on what's going on with these donations to to the protesters up in canada and the financial censorship and how they've had to basically rely on bitcoin yeah it's pretty crazy i mean so i have i think my career has led me led me to have a very interesting balance and perspective. Um, I mean, one of the things I love about Bitcoin is that it challenges the status quo of like banks controlling your money, governments being able to surveil everything. Um, but I also understand the need for some regulation. Um, I, I mean, I think what we're seeing in Canada is really a good example. I mean, it's a, per, a really good advertisement for Bitcoin. Um, I mean, I've seen also the news that they're trying to like, um, you know, get sort of track or, or um, take funds from, from Bitcoin, you know, from people holding Bitcoin. And, you know, that's another like stress um, thing that stresses the importance of self custody. Um, but yes, I, I mean, I think what we've seen over sort of the last like five years, I think I tweeted a few weeks ago, like 
all these current events are perfect advertisements for Bitcoin because like a lot of the stuff making sense in, or ha happening in the world right now, like doesn't really make sense. You're kind of like, hey, like that's people's money. Like you should be able to donate to a cause. There should be able to be like peaceful protests. I mean, the whole thing seems really crazy to me. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I but I, and I've seen just so much um, sort of Twitter activity about people saying, get your crypto off the exchanges. You know, I think people in the US and other countries are kind of taking note of what's happening. Heard that different countries uh, in the past have had, you know, money seizures and all sorts of horrible protests, but never usually, uh, you wouldn't think it'd be US, Canada, anywhere, yeah. like, anywhere like that, right? But then, uh, you know, Canada, like probably one of the last estimates or guesses I would have had for for being in this situation. Me too. And, and, yeah. and, and now you look at it and you and you see as well that beyond the stuff going on in the streets, there's now, I think it's the, I saw this in the news uh, this morning that they're investigating uh, Kraken and, and Coinbase uh, for encouraging self-custody. I think the CEO is for tweeting out encouraging self-custody, which- I've seen that uh, too. I mean, yeah. the idea that, that information should be censored, you know, or like that, that, uh, technology and innovation shouldn't be like shared and explained to people is just insane. I mean, I understand it. We, we see examples of that in the U S too, with, um, you know, regulators always are cr coming up with new things to point to, Oh, Bitcoin's used for money laundering. Oh, Bitcoin can be hacked. Oh, Bitcoin's bad for the environment. Like there's always these sort of arguments of why, the technology shouldn't be able to be used as freely as it's intended to. But I think all of that just goes to show that it's sort of a threat. Like I think government and regulators oftentimes see it as a threat to some of the control that they have. That's very true. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it's very Orwellian really. The, the idea that, Oh, you're sharing information. That's, you know, it's very, that, that to me is very Orwellian, but yeah. um I mean, it's all, it's all pretty alarming. I mean, I, I, I'm an attorney. I, I try to stay, I try to base all my opinions and emotions on facts. Like when it comes to a professional thing like this, um, I'm not one to like promote sort of, uh, um, you know, like fear narratives or like make things, you know what I mean? Like really yeah. come in, into like pretending like there's some bigger plot at play, but it is, it is weird to see it so close to home. Um, and I, I do think it's a good lesson. I mean, I don't, I don't think, um, I think I'd be feeling very different about the state of the world today if I didn't myself hold Bitcoin, which is a weird feeling because I think there's a lot of people that just don't understand it. Um, but I think, I think when people do, it becomes very clear that it's sort of a hedge against all of this stuff. I mean, we talk about a hedge against inflation. Sure. I mean, we're seeing a ton of it money printing and inflation right now, but it's a hedge against sort of any um, attempts to sort of take personal freedoms away. Yeah, I, I suppose one thing as well, though, that it's it brought about is um, there's been lots of times in the past where we've had fund like raising of Bitcoin, like fundraising Bitcoin, whether it be Bitcoin Beach in El Salvador, or right. there's, there's probably there's quite a few other examples I can't think of right now. But with this situation, it's kind of the first time I can think of at least, especially in a, in a, in a sort of a Western state uh, or country that, that you've got a a protest or something like that that's been there's been a big bitcoin fundraising and it's gone to like uh essentially two or three central people who then have to distribute the funds mm -hmm. and then it becomes the question of like how do you get that out of how do you get that out to the people who need it how do you then who don't understand it either right how yeah. do you then get them to spend it like whether it's through using you know uh bitcoin atms or other services uh, yeah. So, I, and, and it recently seems like it's gone a little bit tits up, to be honest. I was looking at Twitter uh, today and, it, and it's all a little bit shaky. Like, I think uh, it's down to one guy who then they were giving out paper wallets, but then they were getting seized by police or something. And yeah. so it's all a little bit, gone a little bit rough, but yeah. it could have gone a lot worse, I suppose, based upon the fact yeah. that this is the first time we've done this. But it, it is quite a new thing. And this feels like what Bitcoin was invented for. This feels like mm -hmm. really the first time I've seen it really go, okay, this is like, this is it. You know, this is kind of the real truest use case for this. Um, yeah, really. sometimes, sometimes it almost feels like whoever Satoshi Nakamoto was, like, in a in a way, saw where we were heading before most people did. I mean, I think 
um, certainly like, and part, part of it's age, but when I like graduated law school, I was not thinking about monetary policy or how to hedge against some of these risks. Um, but once you get that answer, you're like, oh, that is something that need, needed an answer for and something that is expanding. And it, yeah, I think, I mean, Bitcoin and the use of it always has growing pains. You know, there's like, um, it's such a new technology and there's a learning curve for how to use it safely. And so you hear the stories of the guy who lost his hard drive in the dump in some city and every year he's pay, trying to pay more money to get that out. And people like people who aren't in the space bring that up to me a lot. And I'm like, okay, well, that wouldn't happen to you because there's a few st steps to protect something like that happening. Um, and you'd be more knowledgeable, but you know, there's just like a learning curve to it. So even um, any of the issues we're sort of starting to see in Canada, like, yeah, I, I wouldn't, it's difficult initially to like start a new um, like ecosystem or community with Bitcoin and be able to educate people fast enough to kind of like get it off the ground and that, especially when it's like dealing with a state of emergency. On the flip side, what's your take on El Salvador and their legal tender law? Um, I think it's really interesting. I mean, I, um, since I'm an attorney in the US, like I've been kind of following some of the states, you know, putting similar bills in place to become legal tender. Like in the US, it's a little funny to me because, you know, that authority stand, it, is held by Congress. Like no states could make something truly legal tender. They could make it use, more usable in their state or um, be benefited by the tax implications and things like that. But to become legal tender of the United States, you know, Congress would likely have to pass something. Um, but I think that we'll see more of that. And I, you know, I, I don't know enough about the El Salvador, like, ecosystem or um, financial system to know how much like value that's brought to them. But it seemed like a really smart move. And I think we'll see more of that. And if you think about it, like in the United States, as states, as individual states try to, you know, say, oh, we're going to adopt legal tender, that's going to probably add some pressure to Congress. And in the same way, I don't even know how we could really make Bitcoin like a global legal tender. But, you know, it, it all becomes about like the more people, the more countries starting to go that direction. Um, and to me, like, I guess what's what's really interesting to me is starting my career doing, you know, wholesale currency exchange is I saw the friction in that of like every country having their own currency um, and it being physical cash and you needing armored cars and dealing with transact, you know, uh, currency transaction exchange rates, um, even just there in San Diego with with the US and the Mexico border touching so I see a lot of value in um, in Bitcoin being sort of a global currency. I think why it's so why regulators seem so you know worried about it in the U.S. is for a long time the U.S. has kind of ruled the ruled monetary policy. Like the U.S. dollar has had so much value, um, and so they are trying to hold on to that. But that's not. That won't always be the case and the situation El Salvador has been in and other countries, um, you know, some countries have seen this crazy inflation in their currency where they can't, you know, they, I, I saw a picture of like a duffel bag to buy a sandwich, like a duffel bag of dollars to buy a sandwich. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's really interesting and it's all happening faster than I uh, expected to be honest. When it comes to Bitcoin being a global currency, I was thinking about yesterday and speaking with a friend about was like hey, trying to explain that to people, trying to explain why and like why you'd want that in the first place to people who aren't into Bitcoin or, or crypto um, yeah. is quite difficult. And I think like the best way I kind of came across of doing that was to say, okay, when you go abroad to other countries and you only speak English and you're in you know, somewhere in Africa where the guy doesn't speak English or you're in Japan or whatever, yeah. the language barrier is incredibly tough and it's a real pain to get over and you yeah. can't buy food potentially. You can't start a business. You can't do all these different things. And yeah. so the, the way to me is the same thing with currency is like the currency is doing the same thing, but, we, but instead we're kind of putting up these barriers unnecessarily. Um, right. Whereas with language, it's like a little bit more understandable how that has happened. With right. currency, it doesn't have to be that way, right? But then I guess at the same time, 
persuading people to use one currency globally is seemingly similar to persuading people to use one language globally, which is never going to happen. Right. And so I guess it's like, it's becoming a, a t as tough a task, but um, yeah. I think that's probably the best way to, to think of it. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the way I think or describe Bitcoin to someone who's sort of newer to this idea is that um, for some reason we've accepted now that like the, um, the friction that we maybe used to have in conversation right like we didn't always have email we didn't always have text messages whatsapp whatever um there used to be a ton of friction in getting messages around the world or even just to someone else in the united states um and we've been you know the internet had some like pushback and issues and dealing with like encryption and privacy concerns and that sort of thing but for the most part i think the world like embraced removing some of the friction and barriers to communication um, through the internet and use of technology. And um, I don't, the fact that so many of us are just okay with there being so much friction in transferring funds uh, internationally, like cross-border remittance and the fees that you experience and the time delays, you know, like of a wire or ACH, all that friction can be removed by this technology. However, countries, choose to adopt it like to me it's just crazy you can look at like a post office and think wow text message is way better for that i'm not going to send them you know a mail to someone and put a, a stamp on it and like so it's funny to me that 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 doesn't sort of click right away with bitcoin and in part i think i think it takes people longer for it to click when they haven't maybe been the victim of that friction you know what i mean like either they're they still trust the government they still trust the banks and they don't have to send money to family overseas or, or something or or they you know some people can't even get a bank account and bitcoin on an on a smartphone has like given them new access to a financial system so um you know but at the same time it's all baby steps you can't like you can't just force everyone in the world to understand the value of Bitcoin. Like I'm, it's my personal belief that if someone seems like closed minded to it or not interested in it, I never try to convince them like, no, you need to listen. You need to hear this. They'll, they'll come back around when they're, when they're ready. I think. Yeah. That's the thing, right? It's like, um, there's so many problems in the world where if someone's not ready to hear something, then it just yeah. is never going to work. So it's better, right. to, better way. Um, I agree with you there. I suppose um, something that and I'm going to completely switch the conversation because otherwise I'm going to end up talking about this uh, for the entire rest of the podcast. Uh, something that uh, is interesting to me is, so obviously as you said, you you ended up in Silvergate Bank um, dealing with uh, crypto related and financial crime related stuff, uh, which seems pretty interesting uh, to me at least, yeah, and obviously to you. Uh, so how how did you, I guess when it comes to that sort of story, like the next steps, you, you, you obviously were with Coinbase. Um, how did you end up getting to there? And like, what was that? Like, how did that opportunity come about? Like, what's the story yeah. behind that happening? Yeah, so um, so I was at Silvergate two years. And honestly, I mean, Silvergate's still a very big banking player in the US, you know, cryptocurrency scene. And like those two years were, I really thought I'd probably stay there forever because it was just the coolest job to sort of have a bird's eye view of the whole ecosystem. And like, I was getting to see compliance programs and legal work product from like all the big exchanges and all these in gaming, um, crypto in gaming type platforms, software developers. I mean, by the time I left Silvergate, I had reviewed like 80 of the biggest crypto companies in the U S like their, their entire sort of like internal workings. Um, but, uh, but Bitflyer, so Bitflyer is sort of like, I, I just call it the Coinbase of Japan. Um, I don't know now, like what their market shares are, but they're sort of like for a long time have been the household name in Japan where new users often come to get into crypto. And so they were looking to expand into the U S and, um, it was a hard decision to join, but I felt like this would give me the ability to be really hands-on and actually go do some of the things I was seeing the exchanges were doing, like getting money transmitter licenses and the bit license and that sort of thing. Um, so it's sort of like, for me, 
I wanted to stay at Silvergate, but the opportunity was just too, too, um, too exciting personally. And so I was at um, Bitflyer for two years. We expanded. I was with like, I was in the first four founding members of Bitflyer US and helped them get the bit license and like really built out their compliance and legal team. Um, and then I remember Brian Brooks joined Coinbase as their chief legal officer. Uh, and he has a really impressive background. And I remember I just reached out to him actually on LinkedIn and said, hey, Bitflyer is actually around the corner from Coinbase. Um, you know, congrats on the new role there. Would you want to grab coffee? And I didn't, you know, I was like, now, like my, I get so many email and messages on LinkedIn and I never respond, you know, and I was like, I probably will never hear back, but I, you know, worth a shot. Um, and he wrote back pretty quickly and said, yeah, that would be great. And so we just started, I was really looking at him um, just as sort of like a mentor in this space because at Bitflyer, I, I had kind of was doing it all on my own. There was no more like senior attorney besides our, the outside law firms we worked with to like kind of learn from. So um, just kind of built a, a professional relationship with him. And then at one point, I remember him just saying something like, why aren't why don't you work at Coinbase? And I was like, I don't know. I don't work at Coinbase. Um, I knew that it would be a, a, a kind of a different role for me because Coinbase is like a thousand employees. Whereas Bitflyer, we had grown to like 24 in the US, which is still a big jump from four to 24. But, um, you know, I was, that opportunity came, came about. I knew that I'd be able to like potentially learn even more from Brian while I was there. Um, and so once again, I was kind of like, it's a really good opportunity. And I've, you know, kind of helped Bitflyer as much as I think I can after two years, kind of built up, everything was sort of well, it was working as a well-oiled machine. So I was like, I'll go see what Coinbase is up to. Um, and I knew that they'd be dealing with some really cool legal um, issues because they had at that time started listing a lot more tokens um, you know, I, I had read that they were like a lot of companies were starting to look more into like lending and margin lending and that sort of thing. So I just knew that I was going to learn a lot. Um, and so, yeah, so that was sort of like how, how that move happened. And it was, I was there for a year. It was a great opportunity. Um, and, and I learned a ton. Speaking of lending, what's your opinion on this block hundred million dollar fine to the SEC? Yeah. I mean, the SEC is definitely, in my opinion, like quickly becoming the most like hostile regulator we have in this space. Um, I mean, it was, I could, I could see it coming. I know there was like the ICO phase in 2017 and the SEC was getting kind of like, wait a second, if you're using a token to raise capital, that's fundraising, that's within our world. Um, but yeah, I think some of the things we're seeing right now with like, I mean, there was the Coinbase announced that they had approached the SEC to launch their crypto lending um, product. And the SEC said, if you do that, we'll sue you. Um, now there's been the settlement with BlockFi. Like, I mean, the amount of money that the settlement is, is, I mean, not shocking. It's actually relatively small. Um, but I think that it's interesting just that I think the SEC tends to like regulate through enforcement and settlements and threats instead of sort of saying, okay, we get it. This is a new technology. It's not going anywhere. How can we regulate it so that the answer is not always no? You know, um, so for me as an attorney, it's kind of frustrating because there's these companies that truly are trying to do things the right way. I mean, let's put aside like these companies that are just like scams or like want to pull the rug on people or like, you know, shit coins that don't actually do it, anything. They don't, there's no reason for a token to be involved. Um, but for these companies that like, you know, Coinbase, for example, had like 35 or 40 in-house attorneys, like they're, they're putting resources into doing things the right way and approaching the SEC is never easy, right? And so for the end result to just be like, no, we're gonna sue you. It's like, that's just such an odd way to regulate the space. And for me, like, you know, I've always viewed 
the U.S. is like wanting to promote innovation. So it's so strange to see when it comes to like cryptocurrency innovation that that it's a pretty difficult uh, climate for companies in the space. Yeah, that's something that I find uh, interesting and I guess worrisome. I mean, obviously me not as a non-U.S. citizen, I think I've visited New York once and that's about as far as I've gone when it comes to the U.S. But we're all aware that, you know, the U.S. is a big player internationally and and it's good to see free growth and, and things like that. And I think that one thing that kind of uh, I found, that I think I'd find really frustrating is that a lot of these companies have probably looked to the to the SEC for guidance in the past or have tr- and seemingly a lot a lot of them have tried to do the right thing generally it appears in a, in a, in an area where the SEC has been silent i suppose uh, for a long time and hasn't given yeah. any real guidance so then to then I, I i would be incredibly frustrated as a business owner if i then got you know slammed with a 100 million dollar yeah. Um, yeah, I've like well, <laughs> it kind of it's like the the basic fairness is kind of like if I, if there aren't any rules and I've yeah. tried my best to make some fair ones up to follow because you never gave me any, yeah. it seems odd to me to then just kind of punish that behavior like what uh-huh. feels like honest behavior. Right. Um, I mean, I Coinbase that- Coinbase is a good example of that, and like I'll kind of give a little overview, and all of this is public information. It's not based on anything I know from my time as regulatory counsel there, but like Coinbase, you know, and other exchanges have wanted to list tokens and they've put forth pretty rigorous reviews to figure out, okay, we don't think that this token is a security. We feel safe listing it. Um, Coinbase, along with a bunch of other exchanges created the Crypto Rating Council, which is more like a group effort to review tokens and decide if they are a security or not. Coinbase also went and got a broker, acquired a broker dealer and an ATS. And, um, and then, you know, as far as I've been able to tell, the SEC has not said, okay, that can be operational and apply to Coinbase's business. And even if it could, what a broker dealer can do is list um, registered securities. None of these tokens are registered securities because the idea is that they're maybe not securities. So there, there's like this catch 22 where really there's no way for an exchange to eliminate the SEC risk if they want to list anything besides like Bitcoin. And maybe I have, I have like sort of an, like, I'm not sure about Ethereum to be honest, but arguably Bitcoin and Ethereum are not securities and everything else is sort of up for debate. And it's a fact intensive uh, debate. So um, so yeah, I think it's very frustrating for exchanges and companies in general in this space. I mean, as an attorney, you, my clients are people who are willing to pay money, um, and engage with a law firm to do it the right way. But there's certain aspects of regulation in the U S that you can't limit, you can't get it to zero risk for them. You just can't right? like, and until the regulator gives more guidance or changes the way they approach the space. With, with the regulatory uh, clarity being so murky, what kind of trends are you seeing from like uh, crypto startups, like in terms of what kind of like legal services they're seeking from you? I mean, I think what's frustrating is sometimes um, clients or, or companies in general are wanting guidance on how to avoid the U.S. Um, so, you know, you see that and you realize that the product that they're developing just won't even come to the U.S. because that's safer. Um, you know, I, as an attorney, we have to be really careful because the SEC has actually said that attorneys and other professionals are kind of like gatekeepers for their regulation. So um, my firm takes a very conservative approach where we wouldn't write something. We wouldn't have like a token client and give them a document that says your token's not a security. You're good to go the way you've done it. But what we do is we work with, you know, um, exchanges and and projects and protocols to say it would be better if you steer the project this way or don't do don't do that. Don't have a pre mine or don't have the founding team keep a bunch of tokens or, um, you know, just sort of efforts and like that. So um, some of some of the work we do in the space is just trying to make to mitigate the risk um, 
that a company will face with the SEC. Something that I found really interesting um, at the t- so when I first got into cryptocurrency, I I, I was. <laughs> 2018 and a friend of mine was like hey buy uh buy xrp and i was like oh yeah sounds great yeah bank of coin um so that's how i got involved in it right and um then i developed from there but that's something that you know i, I still find interesting is what happens there and, and one of the most interesting things and this is kind of something that i don't know if you were on the council when uh, coinbase listed the token uh decided to list it or not but obviously they then made the decision to delist it when the sec lawsuit happened uh, and I kind of find the lawsuit fascinating because unlike everyone else, they've then gone, yeah, no, screw you. They're going to fight this and see what happens. So that's, yeah. I, I, I kind of keep track of it every here and there because I yeah. find it quite like an interesting, it's, uh, who, who knows what's going to happen. And I feel like that's going to have implications for lots of exchanges as well, who yeah. will have listed that Coinbase included, but loads of others in the US who will have listed that token in the past and maybe still do have that token available for sale. Yeah. Um, so I suppose like, I don't know what 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 is your opinion on that like lawsuit outside of anyone's personal opinions on the token. Yeah. What is your opinion on the lawsuit itself? Like, because I, I haven't seen much about it in the last few weeks. Um, yeah, it's been a little quiet lately. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, so I think that I mean, for if obviously if I worked at Ripple, my this opinion would be different. But for me as an attorney, I feel like regardless of the outcome, it could be a positive thing for the industry because it might, I think that both sides, um, the SEC and Ripple are having to sort of show show their cards a little bit in this process. Um, I've seen some interesting documentation that's come from like other law firms that were involved um, and just like why the SEC feels like maybe Ripple uh, XRP is a security and ETH wasn't or isn't. Um, so I think that anything that we can like glean from that lit lawsuit is important because I agree with you. Most of the time we're seeing enforcement actions and settlements like BlockFi. And so none of that is public information. You don't really understand the reasoning behind it or how they got to that number. Um, so this is, is exposing more. Um, but yeah, I think, I think you're right. I mean, not speaking, you know, about Coinbase specifically, but just, and not even speaking about XRP specifically, like exchanges are at a risk and do need to have like a delisting procedure when the regulatory climate around a project changes. Um, And eventually I think you're right. I mean, I think it's very reasonable to expect that at some point, some exchange um, is going to have some issue with the SEC because of tokens that were launched. And, um, and yeah, I mean, the, the, I think the most confusing thing to me about the SEC is they've been very clear that something can start off as a security and change and, and turn into not a security. Um, Don't you all, think that's like an extremely arbitrary, arbitrary distinction? Like I, what, I think it's, what constitutes yeah, it's all, that? It's all like so fact intensive and it's almost a matter of opinion. Right. And for me, I mean, uh, for the ripple case, like I, I think Ripple is putting up a really good fight. I think it's really hard to win against a regulator because they make the rules and then they explain why something violates the rules. And um, I think that Ripple and other uh, projects who have tried to do it the right way have things to point to and legal opinions and that sort of thing to say, we really didn't know we were violating anything, but I just feel like the SEC has a pretty, has an easier job of saying, well, you did. <laughs> so, um, but I agree with you. Like, I mean, if you look at the Howey test or even the um, digital asset framework that the SEC put out, like every item you can kind of, you can kind of make arguments both ways. It's not a very good test because it's a law and a framework from so long ago. And even their updated digital asset framework, like doesn't, um, it just adds more complexity to the analysis. It still doesn't make it like a black and white thing. Um, and so, you know, there's been like other efforts when Commissioner Purse has suggested like a three-year safe harbor um, where it projects like it, token projects could have some time while they disclose a lot of things to the SEC. Um, 
to become more, you know, sufficiently decentralized, something like that, where it allows projects to like really feel like they have zero risk for a while while they work on something. I mean, I just, I, I don't think that like, I don't think the climate, the SEC is creating a very friendly climate for any companies in the space. What about stable coins? What's your opinion on stable coins? And what impact do you think a potential central bank digital currency might have on stable coins? Yeah, I mean, so I have mixed feelings about it, to be honest. Um, I mean, obviously, I started my career at Silvergate Bank. I understand, like, I think that I think that it, we're a long way away from like Bitcoin replacing banks altogether. These crypto companies still need, you know, need bank accounts and need banking relationships. So in some ways, like any movement towards more adoption um, included, including like banks, like supporting the technology that stable coins and central CBDCs are, you know, uh, reliant on could be a good thing. But I think what we've seen like in other countries and what we'd see here is like right now it's kind of confusing because regulators try to point to Bitcoin as like anonymous and untraceable and that sort of thing. The true anonymous untraceable thing that we have is cash. Um, and so if the banks get rid of cash and we just have CBDCs, they actually have more tools to surveil what we're doing with cash. And like, just to be clear, like I'm an attorney, I'm not saying people should be able to go commit crimes with cash or Bitcoin, but there's some, um, it's confusing to me that people don't understand the value of financial privacy, the way you find value in other forms of privacy in your day-to-day -day lives. And so I, it's kind of a double-edged sword, I think. Um, I, and I do feel like the SEC and the Biden administration and the government in general is trying to like corral this technology by putting it back into banks and stable coins and CBDCs. Um, but that, but Bitcoin will still be, you know, over here. So um, I still think that like Bitcoin is the best and create and created what we're all like working on today, regard whether it's you know, just any any sort of innovation, I think, has really stemmed from the technology Bitcoin invented. And I think it will always hold some of those attributes that CBDCs won't. My my advice when people like ask, oh, why, why do you feel like Bitcoin is the, you know, the prevailing cryptocurrency, the best, is just like go do couple of days on a cryptocurrency exchange uh, help desk and you'll learn pretty quickly why it's kind of the uh, kind of the the answer for that one but um yeah. no I, I find it interesting I, I i think one thing that i'm interested in specifically is so for example with the sec like if they if they keep uh, having successful enforcement and say for example they win against ripple and, all, and everything goes in their favor then i wonder if they will kind of go after stablecoin like USDC, USDT, like Tether and, and so on, like stablecoin companies, um, because of they, they may for, see them as a threat against uh, a CBDC or, or whether they, I mean, it, it feels to me like they would, to be honest. Um, but then I suppose there's the other, there's the other side of the coin that they might want to work with them to maybe somehow yeah. kind of, you know, gain insight and technology to create the CBDC. So yeah, uh, I don't know I mean, where you see that going. <laughs> I mean, I think we've seen that already a bit with like Tether. I think there's a big concern that some sub stable coins aren't like what they claim to be. Um, I think, you know, the idea that like the government themselves should invent the internet or invent a stable coin, like they aren't the, they don't have the same expertise that some of these projects already have. So I think partnering with like a, um, USDC or something like that would be a smarter move. But I agree with you, like if they really want to start from scratch and sort of, you know, I think there's supposed to be an executive order coming out from the Biden administration about some of these things. Like, I think they're going to start really doing their homework. And, um, you know, I don't know what regulatory agency would sort of come after stable coins. I mean, because there's a pretty good argument that a stable coin is not a security because it's state the price is stable. There's not like a expectation of profits or increased value or fundraising, but uh, you know, there's any, most regulators can 
have an opinion on stable coins because of the consumer protection element. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see if, if, uh, if there's sort of like government and tech partnership or if it's like competitive, like you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot that's going to happen in the next, well, probably this year, to be frank, yeah. uh, a lot in the crypto landscape, a lot outside of the crypto landscape, Canada, Ukraine, lots of things going on. So this year yeah. is going to be very interesting. And I, and I wonder, especially if the SEC say they successfully start, you know, winning a lot of these enforcement uh, proceedings I, I can imagine the, the market as a whole dumping somewhat and whether bitcoin will, will hold things up or not I, i'm sure it will but time will tell um yeah. so that's going to be interesting as well um yeah. i guess uh i know we're running close to an hour ricardo did you have any more questions you wanted to ask so i've got one more that i wanted to ask yeah i got well i got two thomas wanted us to ask you uh what's your favorite winery so my my um best friend from like childhood recently bought sunstone winery near um and Santa Inez. So I'm a member there and I love that. Um, you know, I kind of loved all the, when I lived in San Francisco, I loved going to Napa and Sonoma. I think cake winery is really good. Um, yeah, I love, I love wine and Thomas knows that. So it's a good question. <laughs> uh, my other question is, it, this is my last question. Um, do you like Kraken got a, a federal banking charter and there's that other bank that, um, they're opening in Wyoming. That's like a crypto bank. Like, do you see this as like the way forward for banks, like for them to become crypto banks? Um, so yeah, so Kraken, I believe has the Wyoming um, speedy, like this, um, which is sort of a special depository institute in Wyoming. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm probably a little biased, but because I like Brian Brooks, who after Coinbase went to the OCC, the Office of Comptroller of Currency, but I think, um, so right now, like most, like a crack, let's use Kraken, for example, they would have had to, or did go state by state and get money transmitter licenses in every state. They could have gotten the bit license, but they kind of said, mm, screw you, New York. And they didn't get the bit license. I think the idea behind either like um, a state bank, like special depository institution or like the OCC trust or national bank charter is that you would have sort of more of a sole single regulate like regulatory agency to report to you wouldn't have so much state by state friction but i think some of the issues with like the state level um banking institutions is you know understanding reciprocity amongst like if you're a wyoming bank do you get to go um operate in new york or do as new york's gonna say you still need the bit license the other is that i think there's been some struggles of like getting access to fed wire and payment rails so you know for me i i i always thought that the occ trust charter and occ national bank charter would be a really interesting um path forward for some of these exchanges but i also know you know the occ is a federal regulator and maybe there's about value and just sticking to the 50 states and having the bit license and, and going from there. But what I will say is from the time I was at Silvergate to now, the relationship between banks and crypto has definitely changed. I think we're going to start seeing a lot more banks get into the crypto space. Um, I think we're going to see more crypto companies try to become banks. And I really think that in within the next like five years, it wouldn't be at um unheard of to like be able to log into your bank account and see your dollar balance and your uh crypto balance and i think that'll be a really big um yeah i think that'll be really like exciting to see i i can uh, i can agree regarding banking and um, there's a lot of banks globally that uh getting a lot more interested in being able to offer cryptocurrency to clients and, and utilize cryptocurrency as well beyond that yeah um yeah, I keep I keep being invited. So every um, state has their bankers association. So Utah Bankers Association, Florida Bankers Association, most of those conferences they have this year, they're having some sort of um, crypto day or crypto panel because banks are just finally, I think, realizing this is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. Um, and it's a way for banks to be more innovative and turn more looking at like the fintech aspect. So, um, so definitely we're going to see a lot of action there. And yeah, I think, 
I think this year from like a regulatory legal perspective is going to be insanely busy <laughs> and, um, you know, so I'll try to get some sleep here and there. <laughs> yeah, I'd say it'd be busy. I uh, fingers crossed from my perspective that things go the way I would want them to go in a slightly more decentralized favoring kind of way. Yeah. I, I, I have, my, have my doubts, but I'd like to see it go that way. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I suppose that we, we've run about an hour, so it's probably a, a good time to, to call it in. This has been Wine and Cheese with uh, Hayley Lennon. Uh, no, I'm joking. Um, but it's been great to have you uh, on the podcast. Much appreciated. Yeah. Uh, it's an honor. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say? Anything you want to plug before you head out? I don't think so. I mean, uh, definitely if people are interested in the Crypto Connect thing, it's cryptoconnect.org and we'll be um, adding new cities in the next month or two. And um, they can follow me at Haley Lennon BTC on Twitter. So that's about it. I enjoyed our conversation today. Awesome. That does. And same here. I've enjoyed it. And I hope everyone out there listening has enjoyed it as well. Um, but yeah, thanks also, Ricardo, for, for joining joining me, joining us. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, we've loved having you listening. We hope you had a good time. We hope you have a good day, week, month, year. Uh, keep loving life. Keep being awesome. Take care and keep buying Bitcoin. See you soon.